So, Confucius assisted language learning and learner autonomy. Established thinking. Um, the debate about learner autonomy, of course, was originally located outside of Cal. When people first started investigating learner autonomy, looking into the advantages of autonomous learning, of independent learning, of self-study, of students taking control of their learning, of students developing appropriate learning strategies, all of that work took place outside of technology. But I think it's also important to stress that that learner autonomy um, is not just about students going to a physical place to practice English on their own in less controlled situations. Learner autonomy doesn't necessarily take care of itself. Students are not necessarily um, in a position to make decisions about what they want to practice or why they want to practice it or how they're going to go about doing that practice. In fact, Quite often, it's the opposite. So if you go into a self-study centre and you talk to a student and you say, why are you practising listening? They might say, I like listening. Or, I'm good at listening. And you say, well, why don't you practise some grammar? Because I've noticed you're writing, you're a little bit weak on there. Oh, I don't like grammar. So actually, sometimes students are doing the things that they don't necessarily need to do, but they're doing things because they're already good at it and, 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 and they... Enjoy. And of course, today, if you look at many published course book materials, you'll find the influences and the impact of learner autonomy coming through in a way which you didn't see 15, 20 years ago. So there will be opportunities for students in course books, for example, to do quick tests and checks of what they've learned. There will be, in some course books, opportunities to reflect on their own learning. In today's class, I learnt and they have to fill it in through a journal or something like that. Uh, in order to improve my English, I need to dot, dot, dot. And so there are, there are opportunities for them to reflect on their own learning and think about where they are going with it. So learning autonomy is not restricted to self-access centres uh, and, and language resource centres, but very often it's closely associated, those centres are closely associated with the realisation of learning autonomy. Those centres are typically resourced with a combination of paper-based materials and computer-based materials. And within those centres, you will very often see what Susan Sheeran calls learner pathways, which are um, ways of helping learners get to where they want to be. With paper-based materials, for example, it might be colour-coded books. So self-study books for vocabulary with a red sticker are for advanced, with a yellow sticker are for elementary, and with a blue sticker are for intermediate, and so on. Okay. So that's some of the established thinking within the field. Um, and here's just one example of where tutorial Cal is today. We've shifted from, there's, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff out there for students to go and practice their English. I'm sure you're all aware of um, many, many, many sites. And they can practice their listening, their speaking, their grammar, and so on. And some of it's brilliant, some of it's so-so, and some of it's Neither brilliant nor so so. <laughs> and we won't name those sites. I'm sure you've looked at stuff and thought, oh, that's terrible. But here's a favourite with my students, um, cambridgeenglishonline.com. Um, you've got to get there. You've got to kind of get through. A lot of these sites are commercial, of course. It's a .com. You've got to get through a, a bit of advertising and so on. But this particular area... Um, the phonetics focus is, I think, a good example of um, some of the things that can be done with Tutorial Cal, and I think it's also an illustration of how Tutorial Cal has gone from very limited black and white uh, screens, text-based, to um, something more multimedia with more interesting graphics, with sound and so on, and it's all based around... Um, phonetics and phonetic practice and phonetic awareness. So have a look at that as and when you have time.
I'd like to move on and unpack then some of the um, assumptions about computer-assisted language learning and learner autonomy, which arise out of the things that I have been saying. Firstly, computer-assisted language learning, the acronym itself, implies the use of a computer desktop. It was certainly established with the ideas that there's a physical center where students go and work on a computer desktop. So it's a computer component of the assistive language. Secondly is the idea that students go to a computer desktop and then work on an individual software program in order to practice their language. Typically, that would have been um, grammar or vocabulary in the early days. Um, more recently, listening activities um, become uh, possible, reading activities, of course, and to a more limited extent, speaking and writing activities. And productive skills are still much more uh, difficult to develop um, within tutorial cal for, for obvious reasons. Thirdly, is the idea that this kind of material has a very explicit teaching and conscious learning capacity. Students go to a desktop, work on an individual program in order to practice or improve or further develop their particular, you know, their reading in English at an intermediate level or their vocabulary set and so on. As we've already <laughs> mentioned, um, these ideas are usually realized in self-access centers um, or controlled classroom context. So, uh, okay, you know, I want you to go and you take students, if we finish this, for your homework, go to the self-access center and do these exercises on the present perfect because that's what we've been practicing in class. Another assumption is that these things are inherently motivating. I started working in this field um, some years ago, in 1982, 1983, 1984, my first experience of working with technology and language education. And I worked at a military language center in Kuwait. Um, and the language center, prior to that, I worked in Sudan, where the technology comprised um, electricity, if you were lucky. Um, so I then moved to Kuwait, worked in the language center, and state-of-the-art facilities. Uh, the contrast couldn't have been greater. Uh, state-of-the-art facilities, including computers. Four computers in the self-study center for the whole of the language institute. And as, as, as you all know, in Kuwait, um, they don't work on Fridays, but... Thursdays was the sort of the equivalent of our Friday. Thursday lunchtime, you say to students, okay, we're going to go on the computers. Yes, teacher, yes, computers, computers, we like computers, computers, good. And you would have inputted some vocabulary practice using Hangman, for example, um, which practiced the work that the students have been working on earlier in the week. And just the mention of the word computer motivated the students. The only access they had to computers, the only access I had to, to computers, were those four computers. Hence, it was inherently motivating. I would want to argue that at a time of rapidly changing technology, the assumption and links between Cal and learner autonomy are inherently problematic. Um, I've already alluded and touched on some of the reasons why that might be the case. I'd like to sort of develop that a little bit more now and go on to um, look at some of my work. I think Cal is problematic both as a theoretical concept, concept for investigating and researching technology and language education, as well as as a practical concept for what teachers do with technology in the classroom. 
I suppose my starting point was this. Um, there's little in the literature which examines what students actually do in centres and why. Empirical data on the practices and perceptions of learners is noticeably missing. Um, around 1999 at Salford University, we invested very, very heavily um, in a language resource centre. And state-of-the-art computers, uh, lots of paper-based materials, we deliver a range of programmes at my university, um, not just, and this is important, not just English um, as a foreign or second language, but many, many BA and master's degree programmes in modern European languages, French, German, Spanish, until last year, Italian, uh, Chinese, Arabic as a, a, a foreign language. Um, and as I wandered around the Language Resource Centre and started looking at what students were doing in our Language Resource Centre, I started to get the sense that what I was reading about and what I was looking at in my research and my academic studies, that there was a mismatch between that and what students were actually doing in the centre. That what the theory was telling me about the practice wasn't what students were doing in practice. And at first it was just sort of anecdotal observations. I would wander around the centre and just observe what EFL and modern foreign language students were doing with computers. And so I started to look for the voice of the learner within the literature, in the theory and practice of computer-assisted language learning. And I didn't find a very loud voice from the learner. And that's kind of driven my work over the last six, seven, eight years, finding out what is going on in the learners' heads when they are working with technology and looking at some of those mismatches. So, for example, uh, in the Language Resource Center, we have all these fantastic tutorial um, programs for students to work on. And yet I wandered around, and I said, like, they're doing their Hotmail. You know, or they're, you, some of you are smiling, you, you're familiar with this, you know, go and get on with this. It's always the students at the back, isn't it? Uh, okay, you're supposed to be working on this task, and when you look at it, oh, you you appear to be discussing Manchester United. <laughs> when the idea is you're working in pairs in order to solve this problem. And of course, after a while, they twig on. They see, oh, he's coming. So down goes that window. <laughs> Up comes the self-study material. Yeah. And as soon as you go, you, and, and then, of course, you end up with the facilities to, to, to spy on what they're doing from the centre console. They don't know that you're spying on them. There were mismatches. There were clear mismatches. And it was those mismatches and our investment in our language resource, resource centre which kind of started this particular phase of my, um, of my research. And it begins with the idea of computer-assisted language learning and learning autonomy. Um, as valid, useful concepts worthy of investigation. My rationale, as I've said, and this is a, a quote from Kern, the complexity of the issues involved in technology and language learning is pushing us to understand effectiveness in terms of the specifics of what people do with computers, how they do it, and what it means to them. So, the learner at the centre. Um, and in order to ask a series of questions and answer a series of, que of questions, I opted for a fairly eclectic methodology, partly for pragmatic reasons. I'm not a statistician, and, and, and I find working with huge amounts of statistics um, quite daunting and, 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 and difficult. But also, um, I think, uh, qualitative research which talks to students, even if it's on a smaller scale, can give you some insights which the data on a large scale can't. So my approach within my, my methods over recent years has been eclectic. I've used a combination of qualitative data, um, interviews, observations, focus groups, as well as quantitative data, um, questionnaires to tens, sometimes hundreds of students in a range of contexts. And the first thing 
that came out from my experience with our Language Resource Center at Salford, where, as I say, we have students learning EFL, English as a Foreign Language, and we have students on bachelor's degrees learning French, Spanish, German, Italian, and so on. Um, and the first thing that came out, and this was published in a book in 2008, was that non-native speakers, speaking students of English, NSSOE, slightly shorter than the full version, um, <laughs> study, only just, studying English as a foreign language, view a wider range of computer-based materials as helping them to learn or practice English than native speakers or students studying modern foreign languages. Let me explain a little bit about what that was and, and how I arrived at that conclusion. Um, Non-native speakers of English in the Language Resource Center were using those tutorial practice Cal materials. And I said to them, to what extent does this help you learn English? And they said it helps quite a lot. They were also accessing ManchesterUnited.com to check the football or to buy tickets. They were also emailing each other. And I asked them to what extent those kind of activities, the sort of non-tutorial Cal-based activities, if you like, to what extent did they feel that those sorts of activities were helping them learn English? And by and large, they said they felt that all of those activities, that more or less everything they did in the Language Resource Center was helping them with their English. When I spoke to students and took data from students who were studying French, Spanish, Italian, uh, English students who were studying French, Italian, Spanish, and so on. And I asked them what they were doing in the Language Resource Center and to what extent those things were helping them with their Spanish or with their French or with their German or whatever it was. The data came back that only the narrow tutorial packages where they were practicing German listening or French vocabulary was helping with their English. I was helping with their French or, or their German or whatever it was. And so began this sort of exploration of, um, if you like, the unique role that I think we are in as language practitioners. Because we have software programs which help our students to learn English, but we're in a space which is also beyond that because English is the lingua franca. English is the language of the internet by and large and students access and communicate information in the English language. So some of the more specific questions that I moved on to um, was where computer-based materials are available anywhere? Where do EFL students prefer to work and why? I started to get this idea that um, you know, learner autonomy, it may be possible for learner autonomy to take place anywhere these days. In the old days, you had to go to a self-access center where there were paper-based materials, you know, Murphy's, remember Murphy's English Grammar in Use, yeah? yeah was a good example, a, a fine example of self-study material. But students had to go there because that's where the material was. Um, and if they didn't go there, and, uh, you know, and these books were for reference, then they couldn't practice their grammar um, somewhere else, unless they bought the book, of course. So I got the idea, well, with digital materials, what is the significance of location for learner autonomy, when in fact students can realize their autonomy in a range of different uh, places, not just the self-access center? And to my surprise, um, the data pointed to students still wanting and needing a physical place to go and study on their own, like a self-access center or a resource center, even if they were working with digital materials. And here's a couple of responses from the qualitative data to this particular study. Um, so where, where students are available, where do you prefer to work, and why? Student A, it's all anonymized, obviously, but for ethical reasons. Student A, the Language Resource Center. Uh, the only thing in my brain is to study. 
But when I'm not in the university, I will always remember playing games or looking movies. Uh, in the LRC, I think the main, the main point I use computer is to study. So people were saying, although I can study anywhere, this physical location is where I get my head into studying. And I guess if you reflect on that in your own work, I'm the same. You know? I, I, I kind of tried to work on my next paper in my hotel room last night at 9 o'clock. No, I watched The Village at 9 o'clock, at 10 o'clock. And I wasn't in the right place, although I could have done it. If I was at home, and I have an office at home, and, you know, at 9 o'clock in the evening on a Sunday, I'm quite a sad person. <laughs> I might have gone up there, and I would have been in the right place. Student B, uh, you know, in a room, a uh, living room, the more leisure times we should, we should spend, uh, as you'll see, this is reporting direct speech, uh, maybe we will use computer to listen, listen music, play games, and also to do some chat with my friends. So this led me to a conclusion. The point at which the physical world meets the virtual world is highly significant in self-study and the realization of learner autonomy. I started to look at the educational research and literature and there's actually quite a, a body of interesting work going on. Stuff like I hadn't even thought about. Some of the things I had thought about, like how the rooms are organized, you know, mushrooms compared to long, boring rows and so on. Uh, and some of the stuff I hadn't looked at, like the color of the room, uh, the, the lighting of the room, and so on. Was realizing with Zs and Ss all over here. But realizing learner autonomy, computer-based materials uh, versus paper-based materials. A second question I started to ask myself, sorry about the acronyms, I'm a big acronym man, as you can see. The second question I started to ask myself was, um, what kinds of materials do students prefer to use when working in self-study contexts? And why? I did a little study on um, grammar, learning grammar, learning grammar online using some websites, um, some tutorial websites which gave you answers, right or wrong, and learning grammar using traditional PBMs, paper-based materials. Um, the Murphy book was one, and the, the yellow one, Michael Swan, what's it called, was the other. Grammar work, thank you. Okay, where's the other? I got students to work with the paper-based materials, got students to work with the um, computer-based materials, and did a study as to um, which they preferred and why. My students are all younger than me. Even my mature students are younger than me, which is slightly worrying. Um, they're all, if you like, digital, a discredited term now, but they're all uh, digital natives. We'll come to that in a minute. So I was kind of thinking that they would probably express a preference for computers. But the conclusion I come to in this study from listening to the learners' voices was many of them preferred to work with paper-based materials. It would be a mistake for practitioners and other resource providers, is a conclusion I reached, to slavishly follow digitized medium uh, for everything. There is no evidence to suggest that computer-based materials that should be are replacing PBMs, not CBMs, that's a typo. So there's no evidence to suggest that computer-based materials are replacing uh, paper-based materials. When I ask students what kind of materials do you use for self-study grammar practice, Okay, this was what the data, this paper came out in the English Language Teaching Journal. Um, the frequency is at the bottom. The majority of them, it's a small study, but the majority of them use self-study books more frequently than online materials to study grammar. So, the first leg of my journey looked at preferences for computer-based materials, and I started to realize that I think EFL was in this kind of fairly unique place compared to modern foreign languages, in that students seem to be 
appreciating a wider range of materials as helping them to some, in some way, shape or form with their learning. Um, another study looked at the significance of the physical, the, the physical place where learning takes place and the anywhere, anytime suggested that resource centers, self-access centers are still important. And this data pointed to the importance of an eclectic mix in self-study materials. Um, and a mistake in going down, slavishly going down a digitalized route. And this is from somebody who is very much in favor of digitalized materials, but I think a balance is important. Up until that point, all of my work had been taken, all of my studies were taking place at my university in Salford. Uh, where, of course, we have international students coming from a range of countries to a host country context. The vast majority of learners of English as a foreign or second language are not in that privileged context, are they? They're learning English in their home country context, the vast majority. So in a way, I started thinking, well, I wonder what the answers to some of these questions might be and what the answers to some other questions might be if I started to talk to and look at what students were doing in their own country. There's a big difference. International students coming to the UK are exposed to English everywhere, of course. You know, they go out, their lectures are in English, their, their classes are in English, they go to shops, it's in English. Whereas in home country context, there is much, much more limited access to English. Indeed, one of the wonderful things about technology is technology is breaking that down. I first went into language education 30 years ago um, at a time when the communicative approach was just beginning to take off. And one of the limitations of the communicative approach 30 years ago, teachers would say, and, and, and understandably so, oh, it's all very well, but my students have no chance to practice English except in the classroom. That was a problem. So you set up these communicative tasks and they would communicate with each other in the classroom and then they wouldn't use English again until their next class because in the outside world they only use L one That, of course, has changed with technology. Students can use technology in English uh, all over. So in a sense, I was thinking uh, perhaps these were some of the right questions but in the wrong place and that um, it might be interesting to look at what students were doing um, in their own country. Uh, and that was informed by data such as this, for example. The vast majority of people using technology across the globe, in the first instance, come from Asia, primarily China, second instance, Europe. And of course, in both of those two, Europe, bar England, bar the UK, let me say England, bar the, apologies, this is Scots and Welsh, bar the UK and Ireland, <laughs> let's remember Europe does not, by and large, speak English as a first language, and of course Asia doesn't speak English as a first language. So, the vast majority of, working, of people working in a digitalized medium are located in areas where English is not the first language, and yet, the primary language of the internet, internet, by some significant measure, is the English language. Think about it. Think back to the questions at the beginning of this presentation. And we start to see that it's non-native speakers of English using argue, and I will develop this, using a range of di digital devices in a language which is not their first language as a driver. I should move on to argue that they're using it not just to learn, but to acquire. I mentioned the term digital native, Prensky's term. Um, Prinsky distinguished between digital natives, those people that are born into technology that have known nothing about the technology and digital migrants, those people that have made the transition. It's becoming increasingly discredited as we recognize that 
the young web generation, younger students, are not necessarily brilliant at technology. Hence the need for people like Gavin and Nikki's book on digital literacies. And we also recognize that um, migrants, digital migrants like myself, people who have made the transition from paper, um, may have something to contribute. And we may not be quite as bad as our kids think we are. A more useful term today, I think, is the notion of digital residents and digital visitors. This was um, coined by White and Corno to distinguish between those people who spend a significant or spend time, a significant amount of time online. So they reside in cyberspace in some way, shape or form. From the questions at the beginning of this presentation, I guess most of you are digital residents. You'll check your email quite often. Some of you will tweet. Um, some of us are even sad enough to plot our train journey here on Facebook and post pictures of it. He's not here. He's busy shouting at people and directing people. But Gavin started this yesterday, um, and I joined him. OK. Uh, so we're residing in cyberspace. Graham, I think you did too. I'm leaving the airport and I'm in Liverpool. And, and, and so We spend a sniffed amount of our time residing in some way, shape or form. And digital visitors, people like my mum, my older sister, for example, um, once, twice a week, they turn their computer on and they do email. Once every three weeks, you turn the computer on, ask their online shopping, turn it down. Mum, you should look at Facebook. There's really interesting pictures of your grandchildren. No, I don't want to do that. Online shopping. Turn it out. Can you not print it out for me? Mum, you should look at Facebook. It's really interesting pictures of your grandchildren. No, I don't want to do that. Online shopping. Turn it out. Critically, digital residents are free from the data we've just looked at in the two previous slides. Digital residents are frequently residing in the English language as a second language. According to, I just checked this before, this was the latest I could find, I just checked this uh, a couple of days ago, but according to a website, Digital Marketing Ramblings, and I haven't looked at the validity and so on, but I think it's use, some useful indications, Facebook has 1.06 billion monthly active users, 680 million mobile users, 500 million pages, 10 million apps, Twitter has 500 million total users. YouTube has 14 billion views per day. LinkedIn, 200 million users. And much but not all of that activity is in the English language and it is by non-native speakers of the English language residing in cyberspace where English is nil to. And I think it's that which really fundamentally questions traditional notions of and characterizations of computer-assisted language learning and learning autonomy, as um, discussed earlier in this presentation. So my works, this is the most recent, well, not the most recent study, the second, one of the most recent studies. This is the work which was supported by British Council, which looked at computers and learner autonomy. And by this point in my research career, I was finally getting success in some of my research bids for funding, because um, the funding in, in our area is, is pitiful uh, and getting worse, I have to say. Um, but I got some funding from uh, the British Council's research um, scheme to look at what Thais and Emiratis were doing with technology in their own country, um, the impact of the English language on that, the extent to which they felt that their activities were helping them to, uh, uh, to, to some extent with their learning and or their acquisition. And I began, and the, the sample size was a reasonably big sample size, 123 students took part in the, um, in the quantitative study, the, uh, 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 a survey. How often do you use computers in your everyday life? The important ones are along here. This is the Thai total and the Emirati total, which is probably not that interesting for this presentation, but the total is along here. 
um, most days, 74%, two or three times a week, 25%. So the vast majority of participants in the study were um, digital residents. They used computers frequently. They resided um, in cyberspace. I then asked them, when using computers outside your studies, which languages do you usually work in? Non-native speakers, Thai and Arabic speakers. And this is what I found. I'll give you a second to digest that. Only four students reported using only their first language when using computers outside the classroom. One talk about using computers in, as Cal when the teacher says do this to practice English. Outside of the classroom, in your day-to-day -day use of technology, only four students only use their first language. As you might expect, the vast majority use mainly their L1, Mainly Thai, mainly Arabic, and some English. Thirty or twenty-four percent mainly English. Quite a high figure reporting that they use mainly English when they work with technology outside their outside their language studies. And a few only English. There is an inherent problem, problem of course, in, in terms of research methodology with self-reporting, and I suspect there is something going on here about students telling the researcher what the researcher, what they think the researcher wants to hear. <coughs> I find it difficult to believe that, that, that this sample uh, of Thais and Arabic speakers were never using their own language, <coughs> ever. I then started to, wanted to look at the extent to which non-tutorial computer-based materials, to which where students were using them, and the extent to which they felt that those materials were helping them with their language learning beyond the classroom. So, in particular, social networking sites, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, MySpace, MySpace of course has rapidly declined, High Five, um, it was, is, was used quite a lot by Thais at the time, and now it's a bit cheaper Facebook. And for some odd reason, I can't remember why, I included Skype and social networking, which I probably shouldn't have done, but I did. Okay. Um, so, these are, if you like, non tutorial Cal software programs, social media programs. Uh, and I, I want them to answer where they use the materials and to what extent it helped them practice their English. So these kind of materials were being used by and large outside self-study centers. Self-study centers, it seemed, were being blocked for the more conscious learning activities. But they were being used in their day-to-day -day life at home, on the bus, in the university campus, um, internet cafes, and so on. But this data over here, when you work with Twitter and Facebook and all of these things, does it help you practice or learn English? The vast majority reporting that it did so. I don't think I have the data here, no. But if you look at the study, this data doesn't change significantly compared to a similar question about a traditional tutorial CAL program which was provided by their university to practice grammar. Does it help you learn English? Similar percentages were reporting that it helps. So social media in English as a second language by non-native speakers appears to be um, perceived by those users as helping them learn English in some measure, even though there is no explicit teaching capacity within that material. 
Here's some of the uh, qualitative data, which I think is quite interesting and quite revealing. Emirati Mail about Facebook. They tell you about their friends and we share. It's nice, sir, to see pictures, tags, send messages, games, get your friends in the group like a soft game. This guy was amazing. I spent some time talking to him. Um, he's, in, uh, he's in Abu Dhabi and he's a student at Zayed University. And he was telling me about on Saturdays, he joins this Facebook group and he showed me. And they're chatting away as the premiership scores are coming in live. And he, he, he's a um, Man City fan, as you might expect from Abu Dhabi. <laughs> and they're chatting away, need to substitute now. And he's talking and interacting with a global audience in the English language. Set it up, joined it without teacher guidance, without teacher support, though those notions, don't get me wrong, those notions are important, but this was entirely him taking responsibility, doing it in English. When you say to him, does it help you with your English? The answer is, of course. Fifty two point four percent of the study, just over half, reported using a different type of English. There's much debate about whether that's a problem. The internet changes language. Thai female. It's very easy. Don't have grammar. When I type grammar, it's too complex. So seeing social media as liberating her from the constraints of the traditional English grammar system. Let's remember, the purpose of language is communication. And if you're going to use Twitter, you certainly can't start getting into correct grammar, can you? But you can communicate effectively, efficiently, and appropriately with a global audience in English. Emirati female. By chatting, they use different language. A new one, like TYT, take your time. And numbers, like letters. One of the limitations to this particular piece of work um, was the questions were termed were framed in terms of computer-based materials. There was insufficient recognition, and it came out the study had been formulated and, um, and we were well into it. Um, it came out um, later, but it didn't look sufficiently at mobile devices. So my journey at this point was taking on board the things that I've already raised and beginning to recognize the importance and the significance of mobile devices. And of course, I went back to literature to look at what that had to say. And then did a second study. By this time, the funding for the Thai study and the Emirati study had been fully used. Um, so my second study, asking similar kinds of questions, but not with computer devices, but with other mobile devices, um, was uh, just published last week, as I said, in TESA Electronic Journal um, by myself. And Mariana Achilos in 2013, and this was back to asking international students in the UK, but looking at mobility. Which devices do you use for social networking, and what language do you use? So as you see, similar uh, social media things here, but looking at the devices, the decline of desktop computers, clearly comes through. The use of laptops and other mobile devices is clearly important. Data on which language is used is not that dissimilar from the data in the previous study, which suggests some validity to um, the quantitative data. Some qualitative data on Some of the qualitative data, I use my laptop, my iPhone all day, listen to music. Um, I talk on Facebook with my friends and send text messages, also search the internet, maybe information I need or use dictionary. When I'm out and I want to figure something out, either information or meeting or word or something, I use my smartphone. I have it with me all the time and it's easy to take it with me. This was from a Saudi Arabian female, that's all. All of this data to me, 
it suggests that we've seen the decline of the desktop, and it's no longer just about the computer assisted language learning, it's increasingly about other devices, mobile devices. Mobility is clearly significant. We reflect back, I was a student in 1979, writing my assignments by hand. And I made a mistake and I was on page 14 of a final assignment. I thought that, no, I made it. I was on page 14 of the final assignment, and page 3 and page 7 and page 12 weren't that good. But it was that or go to the pub. And you say, oh, I'll just submit it anyway. <laughs> Word processors, of course, changed all that. And ever since, devices have got smaller and smaller and smaller. So mobility is certainly significant. Which in the first instance, many within the literature have suggested we are moving from CAL to MAL. There are other acronyms for this field, Warshaw's Mobile Assistive Language Use, Technology Enhanced Language Learning, and so on. Um, but I would want to argue that CAL and MAL are still too limited because they imply one software program and fail to recognize that students are actually doing lots and lots of different things all at the same time. They've got Twitter going on, they've got Facebook going on, they've got a project going on, they've got a virtual learning environment going on, they've got uh, Spotify going on, they've got a whole range of things happening all at once. So it's no longer about one software program. Hopefully there may be some language learning in there as well. It's limited because of the notion of explicit teaching and learning. It's not that explicit teaching and learning with technology is bad or wrong, or, or uh, as some people have wrongly characterized my work. I'm not trying to say that. That is important and significant. But the picture is a bigger one. These things being realized in the Self-Access Center or Language Resource Center. The inherent motivation, say to go back to my students in Kuwait, say to students today, oh, uh, we're going to use computers. Yeah. So, the pedagogy becomes much more important. What are we going to use them for? Why and how? A means to an end. Traditional computer assisted language learning is a means to an end. The end is learning English, the means is using the computer to learn English. Think about it. It's actually the other way around, isn't it? Many of our students today, the end is to be globalized digitalized network citizens in a global world, and the means to do that is English. The paradigm is the other way around. I've suggested that we need to move to mobile assisted language use, and I'd like to spend the next few minutes just unpacking that, and that will give us five or ten minutes for questions at the end. I um, I have a whisper in my ear that there are things coming through, tweets and so on, so questions from face-to-face, -face, questions um, from here in due course. Mobile assisted language learning, mobile assisted language use. What is it? I've given you the why. We define it in our paper as non-native speakers using a variety of mobile devices in order to access and or communicate information on an anywhere, anytime basis for a range of social and or academic purposes in their L2. I published the article last week, I had a tweet um, a few days ago saying, oh, it's all very well for you Teflers, it doesn't work for, for us people who are working in modern European languages. I think this definition does, it's just that English happens to dominate the internet, but as a definition, I think it could work with any language. So that is how I would define mobile assisted language use. It recognizes social use in the second language in both formal and less formal learning situations. So it's not that everything with CAL is bad, there are still some fantastic tutorial packages, there are still all sorts of ways to practice and learn English, but the picture is a bigger one. Malo encompasses 
Cal in a way that Cal cannot encompass mobile devices, cannot encompass unconscious learning. It recognizes devices can be used not only as a means to an end, where the end is language learning, but also where the end is accessing and posting information as globally networked citizens with English as the L2 as well as the L1 being the means to do so. Mallow and e-acquisition. I talked to Stephen Krashen about this idea in Vladivostok a few years ago. Um, I, I guess we're all familiar with, with, with much of Krashen's work, but his more recent stuff has been on sustained silent reading uh, and the value of just getting students to read. And his work on getting students to read is very much based on paper-based short stories. And his argument is that students will end up, and he, he empirically argues that he shows this in his work, that students will end up with a better grasp of the language than if you formally teach them language. His work was with um, short stories in paper-based form. But I took that notion of acquisition, Krashen's acquisition notion, and brought it to an electronic environment where, of course, most of our learners um, frequently don't read short stories unless they're being told to do so in paper-based forms, but are reading all kinds of things in non-linear ways on the internet. Krashen originally distinguished between learning, which is viewed as conscious, and acquisition, which in contrast is unconscious. It seems to me from the data that I've gathered and, and my work that our learners clearly recognize the significance of this in an electronic environment. So just doing stuff in English is helping them learn English, is helping them pick up English. Whether or not there is a, 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 a clear um, and more interventionist language instruction going on. And this, of course, fits very well with notions of task-based pedagogy. It was David Noonan and the learner-centered curriculum who originally said, what the teacher teaches is not what the learner learns. And in a task-based framework, we can specify what students do, and the oh, students yeah. then draw on their linguistic resources in order to do this. We can specify tasks. But, imp but we can't quite specify input in a more traditional way because input doesn't equal output. If you go and have a grammar lesson with a load of students and then ask them at the end, what did you get out of that? Many of them may say, I got some vocabulary and I got some listening. The proposed MAL framework suggests that while we are likely to, need to, continue, to continue to need to provide tutorial packages for learners, we will need to provide other opportunities for students to access information and interact with the world using a range of devices in the second language of the conference language. In short, conscious learning and unconscious acquisition is personal, social, academic, global, and mediated in a range of devices, mediated through a range of devices in both the L1 and the L2. I think for me, my next step of the journey is the realization of mobile assisted language learning and e-acquisition in home country context. My most recent study was back in Salford. Um, I want to extend this kind of work and go back to looking at how non-native speakers of English are using a range of devices in their own country and the impact of language on that and the extent to which they feel that those things are, are helping them acquire and or consciously learn. So if people are interested in um, possibly collaborating and working together in a range of contexts. I think that is where to go. More generally, I think the field needs to recognize a paradigm shift uh, to the practice of mobile assisted language learning and the acquisition. This is much about informal learning through a range of devices as it is about formal learning and controlled contents. Um, the website will go up there. Um, with all these references, if you're interested in, in my work and in some of the scholars that have informed um, where I'm at with my studies, these are some of the references. Some of them are available online. The most recent one, um, the CAL, the TESOL Electronic Journal, was out last week. And this one, uh, 
Open Access is another big issue. I'll maybe talk about that as another company. But this one is a particularly good journal because it's free. It's free to everyone, uh, uh, and it's open access, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to publish it. Um, you could, I'll put the slides on the Teachable Academic website. I'm sure the Learner Training SIG will have them up there as well. If you're interested in my work, you can follow me on Twitter at Teachable Academic. Um, and there's a Facebook group. You can be, join the Facebook group, but I'm only friends with real people on Facebook. <laughs> people I've met. So please don't ask to be my friend if I've never met you on Facebook. I do have a LinkedIn account where I just network with everyone, including virtually by people I haven't met. The Facebook group is for, this group, you don't have to be my friend. You can join the group and, and discuss and share and engage. Thank you very much. I think we've got seven minutes for questions.